Hello everyone and welcome to episode number 12, the last one of the year of 30 Minutes Robotic Milking Edition. I'm your host, Marcia Andrews, dairy science professor and extension specialist at the University of Minnesota in St. Paul. With us today, we also have uh, your co-host, Jim Sulfur, dairy extension educator at the St. Cloud Regional Office. Soon here, we'll have our uh, producer join us today. Um, so I will first go through some um, housekeep items. So if you're watching, this is a recorded webinar. Just want to remind you, you can join us for the live discussion. If you pre-register at z.umn.edu slash 30minrm. I'll be turning on a live transcript. Um, if you don't wanna see live transcript on your computer, you can just uh, turn it off um, at the bottom of your screen, screen and it will go away, okay? We are going to be use the Q&A box, not chat box, please, because Jim and I will not be monitoring the Q&A box uh, during this uh, discussion. So if you have questions or comments, please type those questions in the box. And again, you can find that on the bottom of your screen. And then Jim or I will ask the question uh, on your behalf for the producer to uh, answer. We're very pleased today to have a dairy from the eastern part of the United States. It might be our first one. I'm not sure if we had one before. So very exciting to have um, somebody from that part of the country where we do in Connecticut, which you think about Connecticut not necessarily being a dairy state. It's so fun to have a very nice operation in that part of the country. So Erica is joining us and she has a very nice story to tell. And uh, we are going away, Gemini. Erica, welcome. And uh, we'll have you do your uh, overview uh, about the farm and a little bit of the history and some of the key aspects of your management practices on the farm and so on. And also a little bit about your store and other uh, initiatives you have. And then uh, we'll come back and help with the Q&A session, okay? Thank you again for joining us today and for being here. We're very Thank excited you. to have you. Thank you for having me. So um, this is our dairy farm. Um, we were established in 1920. We're located in Northeast uh, Connecticut where yes, there is dairy farms. Um, there's actually quite a few left in the state. So we're very lucky that way. Um, so we milk about 400 cows today. Um, a lot has changed in the last 10 years. We crop about 800 acres to about 400 of corn and 400 of grass. Um, the main milking barn you can see is above the um, pit there, yep. So we built, um, it actually was built in two sections. The first half was built and completed in 2010. We moved the cows in 2011. Um, 21 days later, we actually lost um, the barn that they were in before going into there under snow load. Um, so it really changed the trajectory of our farm um, because it allowed us to expand that milking barn. And we were able to house the entire milking herd under there for four years until the neighbor came to us and offered uh, for us to buy his herd and um, we could raise our heifers at his farm. And so we were able to go from 200 or 400 cows pretty much overnight, um, it was a big adjustment. Uh, so that was in 2015. And um, then we ended up uh, doing the robots uh, in 2018. So we've had a lot of change in a short amount of time. So we've got our whole milking herd is right there under that roof. Um, we have the two lagoons, um, the offshoot uh, going to the left is where our, yep, it was our holding area that went to a herringbone, a double six herringbone parlor um, that was built in 1960 by my grandfather. And we were milking in there um, right up until we went into robots. We were milking about 17 hours a day. It took to milk 400 cows. So it was quite a bit. And uh, it was a easy decision for us to decide to go with robots. Um, we already had uh, collars for cows for activity. Um, we are very uh, familiar with the DLVAL program and very had a lot of really good service. Um, so you can see our, um, our cat barn is kind of hidden there, but the lower barn is our up close. Um, that's where our cows are calving out and the calf barns just below uh, behind one of those trees. So we're all pretty much right there. And then the heifers are raised um, about a mile down the road at that neighbor's farm that um, 
we had purchased their animals. So everything's pretty close uh, right together. Uh, we're very lucky that all our crop land is within um, about a half an hour. Um, so I mentioned we do collars on our cows. We purchased that technology in 2013, and that was a huge game changer for us for herd health. Um, not only do we use it for reproduction and to catch cows in heat, but we've also used it quite a bit for low activity and monitoring um, how cows are doing. Um, so we've seen um, a huge decrease in our synchronization use um, program. We're down to 14% better bred that way. We also um, invested in a feed pusher in 2015. Um, what's really nice, this barn's 330 feet. Um, it's, it's two sides. There's one pen on your left is all the first calf heifers and smaller animals. And on the right is your aged cows. Um, so we, our oldest is gonna be 10 in January. So they're living longer, doing really well. So we have a feed pusher for this whole barn, which is really nice. It's just a straight shot all the way down and back. Uh, we invested in fans uh, within a few years of building this barn um, and they are run pretty much if it's over 70 degrees we're running um, that's kind of the interesting thing about Connecticut it could be you know negative 10 or it could be 100 degrees all in one year so we try and keep the cows as comfortable as possible but this barn has really made that possible uh, we bed with sand stalls I was just doing that about half an hour ago um, so we like to keep the cows comfortable we find that Although it is extremely wearing on the robots, um, for cow comfort, it really can't be beat. Um, so we stock, this pen on your right is stocked at about 165 cows today. Um, we have pushed it to 180, so that would be about 60 cows a robot. That's a lot. Um, we find that um, it really overpowers the robots quite a bit, um, especially since we are free flow. So the cows come and go as they want during the day. Um, unless we're doing fetching times. Um, we also are kind of away from the cows, but we do an ad-lib calf feeding system. So we do fresh milk that's acidified for our calves. So we're using all saleable milk for that. And um, one thing I would mention while we're looking at the barn right here is the robots have really forced us to be um, extremely conscientious about herd health, um, especially with the free flow system because we find that if any cows are lame or aren't feeling well, they're not gonna visit the robot nearly as much. So we uh, we do a DCAD diet for the up close cows and really try to focus on how to prevent more than treat. So we can go to the robot slide. So this is one of our pits. Um, we had seen a robot farm in New York prior to purchasing ours that had eight robots in one room and Although we had previously thought of maybe putting different robots in different spots in the barn, we found, uh, really saw the value in putting one all in one room. So when we're cleaning the decks or needing to work on cows, you're all in one pit. Um, so we have one pit on either side of the barn that has three robots in each. Um, initially, when we purchased the robots, we did four of the classics. We were going to do all our first cat peppers and a portion of our older cows. Um, and then the uh, V300s came out a month later, um, so the classics went on sale uh, significantly. Um, so we ended up purchasing two more of those. Um, we see the value in the V300s with the 3DI, but for us to have all the same parts for the robots really made a lot more sense. And um, we've been very happy with the production um, that we've seen from these. I would say the biggest thing for us um, was managing differently. Um, <clears throat> so it was a big change for going from milking uh, two times a day in a re very regimented schedule to robots where anything can happen pretty much at any time. We run about 22 hours a day. Um, so that was a big change for us, but cow-wise, uh, they far exceeded our expectations. So why we chose Deal Laval, um, like I mentioned, our dealer is about a half an hour away. Um, they're extremely knowledgeable. We weren't um, the first robot herd they put in, um, but any issue we've had, they're either a phone call or a short drive away. And we've had some interesting issues in the last four years, um, but nothing we couldn't, couldn't figure out uh, within a short amount of time. So for the first uh, few years, up until February of this past year, we were milking still a small group of fresh cows through our parlor. And that was just for the calf feeding system and for collecting colostrum. And we ended up getting a pretty deep freeze that froze uh, the parlor one night and we decided, well, let's see what we can do with milking and robots. 
And that was in February and we haven't looked back. So we harvest all our colostrum through the robots. Um, we hardly ever have to save cows. We don't treat very often. Um, but if we do, we divert that milk. And if it's good enough, it'll go to the calves. If not, we'll dump it down the drain. Um, we called pretty heavy our first year. Um, a lot of what we found was poor um, utter pla or teat placement on the udder. We had um, significant rear udder height. Um, that really isn't a problem in a herringbone, but will struggle a lot within the robots. Um, so we've pretty much uh, called many of those cows out of the herd, and now if they're leaving, it's usually due to production. So we're a retrofit. Obviously, we built the barn in 2010. What was really nice is that we were only on this side, only had to remove about eight stalls to accommodate the robots. On the other side, where we did have the holding pen, we had to remove about 12, but we don't stock quite as heavy in there. Um, so we're a little bit better that way. Um, like I mentioned, we do struggle with freezing this time of year. So the freezer strips have gone up. They went up about a couple weeks ago and they'll stay up through till March. We noticed the first maybe 12 hours, the cows will be funny about them, but they're usually pretty good and adjust pretty well. So for maintenance, um, I'll uh, admit I'm the herdsman. I'm not doing a lot of the maintenance on the robots. My husband does a lot of that. Um, but I was discussing that with him and a lot of the things that we find um, that we replace quite a bit are airlines um, that wear through um, milk pump gaskets, um, just normal wear and tear. Like I mentioned, sand is pretty abrasive when you've got metal on metal wearing. Uh, but we found that keeping up with regular maintenance, our dealer is extremely good about getting here when maintenance needs to be done. Um, we've learned to do a lot of things on our own through their help. Um, and trial and error. Um, so we learned to do a lot of that. We keep a lot of extra parts on hand instead of having one. We have a couple sitting there ready to go. We even had the opportunity to buy a spare robot. That's um, the plan is to help train heifers when we get a up close barn belt. Um, but for right now, it's been a lot of spare parts that have been right in the backyard, which is nice. Um, our cost per month right around, uh, run right around 9,800. Um, we fetch cows four times a day. We start um, with our first calf heifers that we do for the, four, for the first week that they're in milk. We fetch them four times a day. So we'll start at 3 a.m., do them again at 9, 3 p.m., and then 9 p.m. And they're brought in separately, just first calf heifers, milked, and then returned to the pen. And then we'll go and fetch any other cows that'll be under 50 days in milk that are milking less than three times a day, and any cows over 13 hours. So we're running about 91 pounds per cow uh, for the year. Uh, we're doing about 2.57 milkings per day, where you'd like to see that come up a little bit, but we're stocked a little heavy and we need to call. Um, so we think with that, we can do a little better. We're running about 5,300 pounds of robot. Uh, we're running about 8.92 pounds of grain per day. Uh, we've been as high as 10 or 11 pounds. So we were happy to see that come down, especially with commodity prices right now. We have one pallet that's fed through the robot. Um, we've never changed it. It was designed by our nutritionists. We're very happy with the pellet quality and how it holds up through the augers and, and in the robot. We run about five, right around five and a half percent incomplete. Um, we do have the ability uh, with the De Laval robots to trap cows that are incomplete. So we will go through a list every morning. I'll go through a list of cows that have incomplete quarters. And if they're more than two milkings in a row, I'll set a trap for them that they can come when they, the next time they come in the robot, it'll hold them there for 10 minutes, say they're in the robot, and then we can go take a look at them and get them milked. We average about seven minutes on our box time, which I think is pretty even across the board with robots. Um, we're running about 4.1 butter fat and about 3.2 on protein. Our somatic cell, um, we usually ran about 150 um, when we were in a parlor. We went into this system and we saw 18 months straight under 100,000. We've creeped up, we're about at 115 today, but we're hoping that was one of our goals going into 2022 was to keep that somatic cell under 100,000. Um, we've seen the consistency of the robots smoke the cows the same way every day has really improved butter health quite a bit. Um, we use a lot of, like I said, prevention. So we'll use Utter Comfort, the blue spray on any cows that have high MDI or high conductivity that have been robot picks up on. We'll do visual, visual assessments of cows that are suspect, but we really don't need to treat very many. Um, 
A big change that we saw with uh, when we went into the robots was the labor. Um, the day we went in, we had 12 people milking in a double six, two times a day, so 17 hours. And now we're down to one person in the morning and one person at night. And then we kind of help along in the barn. So we can go to the next slide. So this is just a few of our exciting things that happened just this year. Um, we opened up a farm store. This was kind of in response to the quota system that we got was put on us in 2020 um, to drop production by 15%. Um, we ended up buying about 20 pigs, um, 40 ended up being for the year, and we fed them pretty much whole milk straight. And so we were doing our own pork. We had already been doing our own beef. But we decided to open up a small uh, farm store. Uh, side story, this is actually the barn that housed our calves. Um, so that railing there you can see was the where the calves um, were raised up until from 1960 to 1980. Um, so it's pretty neat. We've got quite a bit of character in this barn. Um, so with the farm store, um, I, I had seen quite a few other dairy farms um, through the country do farm camps. And I really enjoyed um, connecting one-on-one -on -one with kids and teaching them what I love about dairy farming. So we did four weeks this past summer. We did 45 kids. Um, it was, we were, had 12 spots available every week. Um, so we, we did pretty good. We were pretty impressed by it and the kids had a ton of fun. Um, then this uh, middle of the summer, we started these hay wagon farm tours. So people would come and for an admission price, you would get a 40 minute tour through the farm. We went right down the middle of the feed alley and then around by the calf barn, we'd go up on the hill and get a beautiful view. Um, and at the end, they got to enjoy some ice cream that is made through um, where we send our milk. So we thought that was pretty neat. Um, and we found that people, especially in these smaller groups, these wagons held about 30 people each wagon um, if it was full. And they were much more likely to ask questions and engage and want to learn more about where their food comes from and how we process and do things. So we thought that was pretty interesting. Um, and so that was kind of our excitement, all new things for this year. Excellent overview, thank you. <laughs> Very exciting and looks really good. So we're gonna open up now for uh, questions. Um, looks like uh, we have a few. Um, so um, you answer probably a lot of the questions people normally have with your overview, but there's always a few more details uh, that people might be interested in knowing about. So uh, one question that just came up was, do you have three rows of stalls on both sides? And do you have enough bunk space or would you change that if ever given the chance? So you can never have enough bunk space, right? <laughs> right. Um, but we do have, we have the nose, the tail to tail, and then um, along the feed bunk, we do have stalls too, which is why we couldn't do the guided flow system. Um, even if we wanted to, there was no way to keep them off feed. Um, but yes, if I could ever increase bunk space, I would, um, but we found that decreasing stock and density um, really helped quite a bit. I'm trying to get some more turns out of the cows you already have in the barn. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's very true. Retrofits sometimes really hard, then you'll have to do the free flow and that's a bit different, right? Jim, do you have a question in mind you want to ask? Yeah, I've got a couple of them. What do, when mm -hmm. you do tours for consumers or they come to your store and or they look at the barn, what is their general perception of robots? Do they think they're cool? Do they think they don't like them? What is their, what's their perception of robots and how do you sell them to the people that you give tours? So they think it's definitely, um, the kids, it was interesting. The kids are like, that's the robot, that's it. <laughs> and the adults are more like, oh my God, it's incredible. Um, they really like the idea of the cows choosing how they spend their day, that they can come and go. We do obviously fetch them. And I explain, there's really no question that's ever off the table. Um, and we really encourage honest questions. Um, so the adults definitely think it's very neat how the cows can choose what they do, that they have that choice um, and that we're using robotic technology that we're trying you know, to use the best technology out there to care for the cows to make their lives better. That's excellent. So we didn't talk uh, uh, about hoof health. Do you guys use a foot bath do you, or not? Just curious. Oh, I left that out of my thing. Yes, That's we fine. do. We run uh, two, each pen has one foot bath. We, that is one thing we've struggled with since day one. There's no good way 
um, to run them. We've tried them in the exits of the robots. Uh, that was not, I would not advise doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, it just, it slows traffic down. It's just not a good thing. So they're on the ends of the pens right now. Um, and we've talked about running the whole group through, um, but really we hate disturbing the cows. Even on a day where we do sand or we have the hook trimmers, they come in, we trim every cow twice a year. They're here usually every six weeks. Um, just that one day can throw off the barn for mm-hmm. 12 to 24 hours. You don't know. Um, so we try not to do that, but we try and stay on top of individual cows that we think see things pop up um, and just try to be a lot, very proactive about that. Okay. Jim, there's some questions now on the Q&A here. Fox. Yeah. Do you want to share a little bit more of your idea of a spare robot and how that can help in the close-up area? Sure. Uh, kind of a so- general comment on that. Okay, um, so we had an opportunity for a robot that they had just taken out of a barn. So it came with all the parts. And for us, uh, the price was definitely worth it. Our plan, putting it in the up close barn, which we're hoping to be building um, next year, is that we could train the heifers um, ahead of time with just grain. So they would enter the robot, it would ID them, they'd get a certain amount of grain. And then once they came in to freshen, they would hopefully not be as nervous as they are now. We really don't struggle a lot with the first calf heifers. Um, we do give them the pelleted t- uh, the pelleted grain right now in the up close so they at least know what it is before they get to the robot. But we're just trying to make that transition a little bit easier. We've seen some studies that have um, some good results with that. And for us, it was kind of a win-win. So, but we've yet to cross that bridge. <laughs> right. Just a clarification, you made a comment about the cost. Um, Mm-hmm. And you said it was 9800 per month, I think. Yeah. Uh, so what that, does that include? Yeah. Just so to, that is um, labor and parts. Labor and parts for all six robots. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Jim? Just one of the comments I'd like to make is we looked at Marcia, one of the farms where they mm. pre fresh pre trained heifers. And it really was pretty effective in increasing visits when you pre. And there was a German study that was just done in Germany and the same thing. So I think you're having more farms in the Midwest that are trying to figure out how to do a little pre-training of these heifers. Uh, one of the question was, I assume this is for your spare robot. What, what was the cost for that spare robot? Are you willing to share that? Oh gosh, <laughs> I didn't look that up. Um, I want to say it was around 10. Um, we had to go okay. pick it up. Yeah. Okay, that's a pretty but good deal. Don't quote me. Sure, <laughs> sure, but approximate. You, but no. Approximate. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, there's some questions, you know, interest about the, the farm store. Uh, tell a little bit more about it. What's your uh, marketing strategy? What are you selling? How are you getting people to come to the store? Are you doing any shipping? Um, so we're not shipping. Um, our biggest thing that we started, but even before we started opening the store, was the CSA program. Mm-hmm. Um, so supporting local is pretty huge uh, where we are. Um, our area is extremely um, in favor of that. So we were kind of already in a good market. Um, although I would say within five to 10 miles of our farm, there's at least six or eight other farms that are doing mm-hmm. the same thing and, and doing it very well. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're is a lot of demand, but there's also some competition. So the CSA program kind of set us apart because it was like a monthly membership where they'd get so much meat per month of pork. And then we added the beef program um, later in the year. We also started doing cow milk soap about a month ago, uh, just to kind of, I guess for fun, (laughs) a little extra time. Um, So we added that. I would say our marketing is primarily Facebook. Um, word of mouth is huge. If you can get someone else to say, hey, this product's really good, that'll, um, re- that works wonders. Um, we've done wholesale uh, with a couple of restaurants that were near us. Mm-hmm. And we do um, some donations of our CSA packages to kind of get our word out. Um, so we, we're pretty, uh, pretty pleased with how our sales went for the first year out. Yeah, that's very good. Yeah. Do you think the COVID situation last year helped a little bit? People looking for food? Uh, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Um, that was really our motivation coming mm-hmm. out of um, once COVID hit. You know, we'd been talking back and forth about how we were going to um, market the farm and try to keep things um, relevant, especially in the area we're in. Growth wasn't really the avenue we wanted to pursue. So how, you know, I've got three kids we're raising on the farm. How do we 
kind of build the business, but not keep building on the dairy side of it. And that was kind of how we could build on it. Um, and that's where that came from. But I think if you didn't jump on the bandwagon of mm -hmm. supporting local and really reminding people where their food came from after COVID, I I'm not sure we'd get another opportunity like that. Sounds good. Jim, there's a few questions next year that if you want to tackle them kind of together, that relate to costs in general, looks like. Yeah, one is kind of the cost of consumables. I think it's around that 9,800. Does that include your consumables or do you know what your consumables are? So cheat dip nope. and so wash. The, the chemicals were separate. I'd have to pull that information. Okay. Okay. And then the other was, uh, I think that was a cost per month for all the robots. I think it's just a clarification or cost yes. per year per robot. That was no, per month for all six robots, correct? Yes, yeah, per yeah. month. Yeah, so that's pretty, so it kind of falls around that. Um, Another and clarification. Why, yeah. yeah, why free traffic? That's a good question. Yeah, I think you expanded on that mm -hmm. a little bit, but you want to expand maybe yeah, on so we. We really didn't have the option um, for guided flow without putting in, we could, we actually could, the way the barn's set up, we could have done sort gates. Um, we would have never been able to isolate cows off of the feed alley. Um, but I think from day one, we were gonna see how the free flow went and then decide if we could add in the sort gates after. Um, we've seen days where the cows don't flow when it's 90 degrees, um, they don't flow as well. But we found that if we can keep things consistent, keep them happy and healthy and, and really wanting to go to the robot, um, we didn't see as much of the value in the guided flow, although we've seen some farms that make it work extremely well. For us, it just it wasn't quite the right move. I would say one thing, um, we were about a year into our robots and we were doing, I think, two, three turns and we just couldn't break that two, five. And, you know, you always have in your head you want to get to three X. Um, and we found out that our meal size, we had two big meal sizes and the third one was a tiny meal. And so we were training our cows to go to the robots twice a day. Um, so we worked quite a bit with, you know, through deal about the dealership, you can't replace that knowledge that they bring and the people they can bring in to help you. Um, and just that small change, we went almost right to 3X overnight. Mm -hmm. Those details that matter a lot. Yes, that's so yeah. true, right? Just little tweaks like that. Right. How many, uh, what a percent of your cows are fetched every day? Because usually free flow is a little more than guided. I was just curious what is in your system approximately, how many cows per day? So or... we, I'd say each fetch, we probably do about 15. 15, okay. For yeah, the three robots, you mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's, I need to calculate my head <laughs> later, <laughs> the percent. So anyway, then. Go ahead. A quick, a question quick question, Al Jim, because oh. I only have two minutes. So go ahead. Yeah, you're a really a excellent entrepreneur. I think of the things <laughs> you started. Do you have anything else in your mind? Are you ever thinking about on farm processing, or what's your next step in your value added business, or where do you think your farm's going? Um, so we definitely, I enjoy um, the touring. I enjoy um, the one on one. I don't want to do big groups. <laughs> Um, but I enjoy the one-on-one -on -one and um, that people want to learn more about their food, where their food comes from. Because I think two generations ago, everybody knew about farms and what it took to run them. And now that's really gone. Um, so I enjoy that part. Um, my sister actually does on-farm processing about five minutes down the road. So mm. I'm not sure that's where we're going to go, um, but we'll see. We've got a few things <laughs> up our sleeves, but we'll see. We're kind of happy where we're at right now and we try to do what we can do well. Um, and then if we have room to expand, we can do it, but let's, uh, we'll focus on what we're doing right now. Excellent. So um, if we have any other couple questions, we can stay a little longer, but I would like to end the recording and thank you for joining us today, Erica, uh, for this last episode of the year. Hard to believe that a whole year went by and Jim and I started this back January of this year and it uh, doesn't feel like it was that long ago. Um, so thank you for joining us today and uh, sharing this very interesting story with uh, what we're doing besides you no know, milking your cows with the robots. You're also doing a lot and you came, came back to the farm, new generation taking over, female taking over. That's awesome. So great example, yeah. a great role model there for, for many. And um, I'd like to invite everybody to join us uh, for the next episode. It's going to be now 13 on, on January and wish all of you happy holidays. Um, it's a Christmas next week already, hard to believe. And enjoy um, a break, hopefully, with your family.